the future. Some look forward to it, others fear it. Regardless of your feelings towards the future though, the depiction of it has taken many forms. From flying cars and living in the sky, living in space on space station colonies, or a dark dystopia, the future looks different to all of us. One depiction comes in the minds of Charles Cecil, co-founder of Revolution Software, and graphic novel artist Dave Gibbons, who collaborated to create the cyberpunk future that is beneath a steel sky. A point and click adventure game where you play as a wanted man trying to escape a corrupted and soulless city. If I was to play this game in full, it would take me forever because I'm not a smart man and I'm not good at games or making YouTube content, so I played it for an hour to see how far I could get. As soon as you boot the game up for the first time, you're thrown straight into the game's first cutscene. The opening credits flash on screen and then a comic book style slideshow narrates the story to you. The village elder of a tribe that live in a wasteland known as The Gap has a vision that bad things are about to happen and, you guessed it, they do. Among the tribe is your character, Robert Foster. And in case you're wondering, yes, he is named after the lager. And his sassy robot companion, Joey. While Foster questions the Elder on his vision, the tribe is attacked by a helicopter. Joey is destroyed in the attack as Foster takes cover. A man known as Commander Reich exits the helicopter and interrogates the Elder. He tells the Elder they're searching for someone and Foster matches the description. Foster then has a flashback which informs us of his backstory. An only survivor of a helicopter crash when he was just a child, Foster, back then known as Robert, found himself in the gap and was found by a tribe and raised as one of their own. He learnt skills like mechanics and technology and eventually was given a second name, partly because he was a Foster child, but also because the Elder saw it on a can of Foster's lager. Foster's. Good call. As the Elder is threatened, Foster steps forward and goes quietly. As they fly away, Commander Reich orders the destruction of the tribe. Oh, he a bad man. They take Foster back to the city, when suddenly the helicopter malfunctions and crashes. How could the same shit happen to the same guy twice? Foster emerges from the crash and flees in from the pursuing guards, who give up quite quickly if I'm honest, into a nearby building where he casually walks up the stairs to hide. from the guard in hot pursuit. This is where you gain control for the first time as Foster. With this being an old game, there's no tutorial, but still there is a solution to a problem like this. Push every button on the keyboard till something happens. You use the mouse to highlight things in the environment. Left click looks and examines the interaction while right click makes Foster attempt to use it. You can also right click items in your inventory to use them on people or items you find in the world. If it doesn't work, Foster will just shrug at you. Moving your mouse to the top of the screen accesses your inventory. P pauses the game and F5 accesses the pause menu. Strange, I know. To get out of this scenario, you have to pull a bit of rebar off the wall then use it on the jammed door to hide from the guard. Oh no, don't make me watch him go up the stairs too. Oh, thank fuck. Unfortunately, the door leads nowhere, but thanks to some quick thinking, we avoid the guard. Heading back inside, the guard has left and we can freely explore the workshop. Our first task is to try and find a new body for Joey, whose memory chip we pulled out of his broken corpse near the start, which we find in the next room. Despite the big, cool looking robot being an obvious choice, Joey's chip doesn't fit in there. Instead, we have to find a cleaning robot in a pile of scrap. He's not happy about it though. Welcome back, Joey. Is this the best shell you could find? Listen, we're in deep trouble. You've turned me into a vacuum cleaner. It's functional, don't be ungrateful. We also meet Hobbins, an employee here. You right click to talk to people, then the characters will awkwardly shuffle into position where they can speak. A menu lists all the available dialogue options. Choosing one will initiate conversation. Talking to characters will reveal information about the lore or potentially give you clues on what to do next. All conversations are voice acted and with it being an English studio, 
there's going to be some accents you don't normally see in games. The acting is decent, but every now and then you might bump into someone who wasn't quite up to snuff. You what? I said, you what? Another corporation, you thick wit. I wish you would call me that. My name is Anita. Don't answer back, woman. Report to the testing room immediately. Symbol my bum. Talking to Hobbins, we find out that the bigger robot outside is broken, and Hobbins knows how to fix it but doesn't have time. So, we get Joey to help us. Despite what you might think, Joey isn't just sarcasm and comic relief. You can instruct Joey to interact with the environment in some situations by talking to him. If he can, he will, but if he can't, he will give you a clue as to what he needs to be able to do it. In this case, we need Hobbins to tell us the exact issue with the robot before we can tell Joey the issue. Joey then fixes the robot while accusing us of being a pervert. This is embarrassing, Foster. You're not going to watch, are you? I always suspected you of being a voyeur. Come on, just do it. Here goes. There. How was it for you? And our first puzzle is solved. Though you might not think so at first. Sometimes you have to play the waiting game in order for a puzzle to be solved. Most of the time, this is waiting on Joey to follow you around and catch up to you. But at times it's just a case of sitting and waiting. Using this puzzle as an example, we need to go to the floor below. We can't reach it using the lift though because the alarm goes off when we try to stand on it because we're too heavy and then Hobbins will come out to fix it. We can then use that opportunity to steal his stuff, a spanner and a sandwich. Upon fixing the giant robot, it means that it will start putting barrels on the lift. Eventually. In its own sweet time. Today! When it finally does, we can now use the lift for some parkour. Parkour! Parkour! Progress! We are now in the furnace room, though I don't like the way that camera eye is looking at me. It is pretty though. As I mentioned before, Dave Gibbons worked on this game. Some of you may recognise the art style from the beginning cutscene, and this may be because you've also seen his work in The Watchmen and the 2000 AD series. If you are a fan of his work, you will occasionally spot something in the background that has that Gibbons flair to it. If you aren't familiar with his work though, you can still enjoy the artwork. All the backgrounds are crisp and clear so you can navigate them clearly. The pixelated character models are well animated and sometimes they look really good during action scenes. In the furnace, we find a locked door and a keycard panel. We don't have the keycard, so we won't be opening it anytime soon. Maybe Joey can help. But how are we going to get Joey down here? There's no way that... Oh, never mind. Apparently cleaning robots of the future can fly. So Joey hacks the door. As we try to leave, we are cornered by Commander Reich, who addresses us as Overman. He attempts to kill us, but the security camera shoots the gun out of his hand. Reich tries to reason with the camera he refers to as Link, but is then killed himself by the security camera. What the hell is going on? Reich seems pretty cut up about it. Boo, you stink! So now that the game pulled a Snoke on Commander Reich, we loot his corpse to get his glasses and his ID card. Leaving the room takes us outside, and this is where you realise that this is the point in the game where the point and click style of gameplay is going to ramp up. In this area, there will be a lot of back and forth as you explore the different locations, meet the characters, examine every little pixel to find something you can interact with, use every item you have on anything you can find, and wander around lost as you try to figure out what to do. First, I went to the security station, where we meet these two, Sam and Norville, a comic relief duo. I'm here to inspect the building. Yes? That's right, routine inspection. Yes? Heard anything about an inspection, Sam? What kind of an inspection, Norville? A routine inspection. Routine? Oh, that's unusual. It's not convenient right now. The writing in this game is very... British, I think is the best way I can describe it. It's got moments in it where it's serious, but when it's trying to be funny, it's a very specific kind of humour that not everybody is going to get. Fans of Monty Python may find a fair amount of humour here, otherwise it's a kind of humour that makes you roll your eyes and go, 
<sighs> there are also times where they make a reference to something as a joke, but often it has the same level as effect. What's our present location? I'm not sure, but I have a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Other characters of note include the lazy mechanic who yells at you no matter what you do or say near him, Lam, a factory owner who has the look about him that just screams greedy fat cunt, and Anita, a woman who works in the factory. You don't speak to her for very long, but DAMN! That's a sexy lady. All the while you're in this section, you'll have to deal with the sometimes catchy, sometimes annoying, but atmospheric music, which is also loud as fuck. Thankfully, however, you are able to turn it down in the pause menu, but I didn't notice this until a few seconds before I stopped playing. I wouldn't mind so much if the music would turn itself down when you're in a conversation, but it would only do this on very few occasions, so most conversation I had would be drowned out by the music, and you can imagine how frustrating that is as I'm trying to explain to you why this game is good and why I think you should play it, but you can't hear a word I'm saying right now, so imagine the frustration you must feel as you didn't think it was an option to do it. And that's where babies come from. Now if you're planning on giving this game a go yourself, I won't spoil everything here so you can have a try at figuring out the puzzles for yourself, though I will mention a very valuable tip. If you get stuck, try showing things to Joey, as he can analyse items so that you may learn a hidden quality about something you're carrying. It helped me when I got stuck here. Give me an analysis, Joey. I think it's putty. You're wrong. That's plastic explosive. An explosion, you say? <clears throat> oh, that was only tiny. In conclusion, Beneath a Steel Sky is a must-play game for people who like point-and-click adventures and dark science fiction-themed media. Now, it may seem like I've not said a lot, but I can guarantee you there is a lot more in this game to explore. But like I said, it would take me forever to get the entire game played and enough footage to do a full review about it. But these videos aren't a review, they're just to bring them to your attention so you may consider having something new to play. It's a nice simple game and you can get lost as you try to figure out the problems. The characters are memorable, Joey has some funny moments and the world is very nice to look at and you can get engrossed in just the scenery. And every time you make progress, it's so satisfying. If you want to play this for yourself, it's free on Steam and works perfectly fine on Windows 10. So, now you've heard of it, would you play it? Let me know down below. Thanks for watching everyone and remember, you're always welcome at the Spectrum.